Hi church, I'm Corey Camp, and I'd like to invite you to our park service taking place next Sunday. The Senior Center is going to be closed for the HB Marathon, so we're hosting Church in the Park at 10 a.m. Gather with us in front of the bandstand in Huntington Beach Central Park East for worship, teaching, and potluck lunch. You can park your car at Central Library, head down the path toward the bandstand, bring your own chair or blanket to sit on, and a side dish for lunch. We'll have bounce houses for the kids and a big picnic after service. I also want to mention that as we learned last month, sometimes the weather can be a little iffy and we have to make last minute calls on whether we're able to meet. So now is the perfect time to make sure your information is in our database by filling out a connection card with your phone number. That way you can receive our churchwide texts about whether or not we're gathering next Sunday. You can fill out a connection card online or at the connection table and we can make sure your phone number is in our system. I also want to invite you to a forum Serve City is hosting on Tuesday, February 6th at 6.30 p.m. on how we can care for our unhoused neighbors. Serve City is partnering with the City of Huntington Beach for an evening of equipping believers from across congregations of our city. Leaders who oversee the homelessness initiative in our city will share with us how we can partner with them and other churches in caring for the unhoused. As believers, we know this is in line with the heart of Jesus, and so we invite you to come and hear what local pastors and our city leaders have to share with us. The forum is being hosted by our friends over at Calvary Baptist Church off Beach and Garfield, so please sign up at brancheshb.com and come learn with us. Also, for you musicians out there, Brian is hosting a guitar workshop for anyone with a guitar in our community. If you want to lead worship for your community group, family, kids ministry, etc., this workshop is for you. Bring your guitar to the warehouse after church on Sunday, February 18th at 1 p.m., and Brian will be dishing out some tips and pointers on how to take your guitar skills to the next level. Okay, that's it for my announcements this week. I'm now going to pass it on to our mission partner, Horizon Pregnancy Center, for an update. Hi, I'm Deborah from Horizon Pregnancy Clinic. I'm here to say thank you, Branches, for your support and your prayers over all of these years that we have um, partnered. But what do we do? We offer women hope, and we do that by sharing free services through giving them ultrasounds to help them with their early detection pregnancy. We care for them. We share the gospel with them, we pray with them, and we offer classes that take them through their pregnancy and beyond. So today, again, I'd like to thank you all for your support and your kindness, but more importantly, I want you to hear from Elaine so she can share a personal story. Hi, my name is Elaine, and I began to volunteer at Horizon in November of 2019. I took their training to become a mentor for clients in the Earn While You Learn program. Horizon clients can elect to take our free online video courses that teach and empower them to become good parents to the baby they're carrying. Uh, they also earn points to spend in Horizon's baby store to get diapers, wipes, clothing, blankets, and other baby essentials. I volunteer once a week to make phone calls to my assigned clients uh, to check in with them and see how they're doing and answer any questions they might have about the class they completed. I also offer to pray with them, and most of my clients accept that offer. I met Arcelia about three years ago when she was pregnant with her son, Miguel, and I have enjoyed getting to know her, cheering her on through the months of her pregnancy, hearing about Miguel's birth, and encouraging her as she has been learning and practicing how to be a good and loving mom. We first met in person when she came in to shop in the baby store after he was born. I'm very proud of her and her accomplishments. She has completed all the video classes that are pertinent to her life circumstances, and she is an amazing mom, and her son is thriving. My name is Cecilia. I got pregnant at age 33, my first pregnancy, and I was scared of being a single mom. My sister that goes to Planned Parenthood came across pamphlet, and she sent me a picture. I decided to search the internet request um, some info about parenting. I'm, th I'm thankful I came across Horizon because I met Elaine. Elaine has been my mentor. I get to talk to her every Tuesday and discuss about my assignment assignments about parenting and other subjects. When I find myself alone or sad, I remember Elaine's words saying, 
I'm a wonderful mother and that gives me comfort at the end of our meetings we pray together I am beyond thankful I'm blessed for having Elaine in my path this has been an incredibly impactful ministry so if you want to learn more about how to get involved with Horizon Pregnancy Clinic come to the connection table and ask for more info all right that's it for today please welcome up Andrew as he continues our series in first Corinthians Amen. Well, good morning. It's good to be with you. To me, that's the embodiment of being pro-life, is walking with these lives, is empowering people as parents to value and treasure their role as parents. What a beautiful thing. Thank you, Elaine. I don't know if you're in the room right now or you'll be in the room next service, but uh, look at the incredible ministry opportunities and what God is doing around us in this community. I mean, it, it's astonishing to me as I consider, you know, the church is coming together to host this class, caring for the unhoused alongside the city. This is stuff that was not happening when we began uh, a little bit over 10 years ago. You think about hosting a youth gathering and 15 young people giving their lives to Jesus here in the city of Huntington Beach. There was not a youth movement that I knew of, at least, in the city of Huntington Beach happening a little over a decade ago. To think that the first time a Jesus club is gathering together on the campus of Dwyer, they have exceeded the capacity for the classroom and now have to request the gym for the future. And that's the first meeting. That kind of stuff is not what you're hearing in the news headlines across this nation regarding this next generation. So I'm just telling you guys, this is a move of God, what's happening around us right now. We've got to be a part of it. I shared last week, we're giving $100,000 to help fund this building project for Common Ground to get a space in the Oakview community to purchase a house. I asked you guys to give on the spot, give this week. The, the best figures that I can come up with is that you guys gave an additional forty dollars or $50,000, but that's not accounting for the commitments uh, that they have to tally up. So right now they're at about $550,000 toward their goal of $1.3 million. I know they met with the city on Friday. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable God-sized stuff that is happening in our midst. And I hope that you guys feel enthusiastic about this. I hope that you get a sense of what God is up to. But, you know, oftentimes we are a little bit ignorant of what God is doing. And I think 1 Corinthians chapter 2 is going to reveal that. Let's open up 1 Corinthians chapter 2 this morning. If you need a Bible, go ahead and raise your hand. One of the ushers will pass one to you. Last week in our study in this series, we heard Paul speak about the message of the cross as foolishness to the world. It's just plain stupid, the things that we believe to non-believers. Why would God put on flesh to die in weakness, expressing self-giving love for the forgiveness of our sins who are, you know, we're sinners. Why would he do that for us? When you look at the world and basically every ruler and everybody in authority is just trying to bring glory to themselves at the expense of everybody else. I mean, that's how the world works. It works in the exact opposite way of the way that God works. So the world couldn't understand the gospel. Ancient people couldn't understand it because they'd never heard anything like it before. They'd never seen anybody in power do what God was doing. But Paul argued that's how God works. He works in ways that the smartest minds of the world could never dream up to put us itty-bitty human beings who think we know everything in our place and to make a spectacle of human pride so that no one gets the glory and credit in this life except God alone. This whole section of Corinthians is about that topic of who gets the credit. Who gets the credit for the things that happen in the world? Who gets the credit for the things that happen in our spiritual lives? You know, in the Corinthian church, they're giving credit to these human leaders that think they deserve a claim, and it's splitting the church in all these different directions. So who's supposed to get the credit? And on this topic of getting credit, my, my daughter is uh, tasked with uh, doing this school project this week. Uh, she's got to create a replica of a California mission. Uh, so she's got to create a little structure, right, that mimics these, you know, missionary buildings that were built, you know, hundreds of years ago here in California. Uh, I keep saying she's got to do it. I've got to do it. 
You know, and my wife has helped her with other elements of this project, but she's kind of, you know, given this one to me, and she says, oh, it's going to be very simple, Andrew. She says, you know, you're just going to build it with sugar cubes or something. And now I'm insulted by that because I am going to be using original materials that they used in the 1700s and 1600s. I am going to use timbers and plaster to construct this. I told my wife, we're going to be able to inhabit this thing when I'm done. It's going to be a second ADU in our backyard. And my wife says, look, this is what's amazing. The best ones of these projects they get uh, put on display in the district office. And I was like, dear, that's like the dad's hall of fame, (laughs) basically. Because what one of these kids created those projects that is going to be on display in the district office? And it's the same thing with our spirituality. People often get the credit for the product, for the return, for what occurs. People like me, you know, in pastoral roles, often get the credit for the things that come only from God. It's all by God. That's what we're going to see here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let's read together, starting in verse 1. So it was with me, brothers and sisters, Paul writes, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, But not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught By the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness or stupid and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ." Wow, quite the claim here, and we're going to be delving into it. But it all begins with Paul, uh, you know, explaining his personal weakness. And and as we saw last week, we see here again, Paul is not shy in these first couple of verses about making little of himself as an order. He's not embarrassed about his shortcomings. He says in verse 2, he did not approach his audience, the Corinthians, with any TED Talk style swag. You know, he didn't want them to be swooning over his apparent charisma. He resolved, as he says in verse 3, to know nothing among them except Christ and him crucified. The best way I can say this is Paul wasn't standing on a platform in front of the church trying to get himself some acclaim and some renown. He says, I got down on my hands and knees and became a platform for the message of Jesus to stand upon. I was going to lift that up. And his was not a platform of human strength, for he says in verse 4, he spoke with great fear and trembling. Now, in a lot of my study over this passage, uh, you know, a lot of the scholars seem to want to suggest that Paul wasn't actually stumbling in his speech. He wasn't actually afraid. He actually was a really good speaker, but that he was, you know, experiencing some fear and trembling before God, knowing the, the weight of the task before him. You know, he couldn't possibly actually stumble with his words 
and show some sort of a weakness. That's what I, that's what I seem to read. And, and though I agree that Paul probably felt some you know, fear and trembling as he considered the weight of his duties, I also think that we're trying to get away from the humanness of Paul's confession by saying he didn't actually stumble with his words. And I think that reveals uh, weakness in us as human beings that we just can't tolerate any semblance, any hint of weakness in our heroes or our leaders. It's like when you, when you hear about the president, if the president of the United States, like Trump or Biden, trips, if they trip, it becomes a like front page national news story about how American weakness has been revealed on the international stage because our leader that represents the nation tripped. And in my mind, I just go, man, these guys are in their late 70s, you know, 80s at this point. Uh, they do a lot of walking. Maybe they just trip like every other human being trips. But, you know, we just can't handle humanness in our leaders because we need them to fulfill this God image. We're looking for someone to fulfill that picture of a God image for us. So forgive me for tearing down this idol worship of Paul through Christian history, which I believe exists, but I don't think he'd mind me believing he tripped over his words as he was sharing the message of Jesus. You see, when we realize he wasn't a giant on his own, but was actually pretty unimpressive, I think God gets more credit for the work that was done through him. And it makes it obtainable that maybe, just maybe, people like you and people like me that feel woefully under-equipped for God's work, maybe God can also use us in our weakness. You know, that was Paul. With his lack of persuasive ability, he admitted he had nothing to offer save what God was offering, which is the message of the gospel. He says in verse 4, that he gave only a demonstration of the Spirit's power. That's all he could offer. And we might assume, based on worldly values, that, oh, he's performing signs. It's very sensational. But where was the power for Paul? He defined it back in chapter 1, verses 23 and 24. The power and wisdom is the message itself, the message of Christ and him crucified. That's where Paul wanted the Corinthians' faith to rest, not in him or in his abilities, it was Jesus he wanted to give all the credit to. Now, Paul does contend, even though he was not, you know, slaying it with some worldly charisma or some worldly wisdom, it was a true wisdom that he spoke with, a spiritual wisdom. He calls our wisdom as Christians in verse 6, not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Ironically, all the nations of Paul's day and all the rulers that made up those nations, those nations don't exist. So literally, what he was saying is true. They literally came to nothing, but it's the wisdom and mindset of them as well that was coming to nothing, just as the wisdom of this age is coming to nothing. For example, what financial planner in our age, using the wisdom of the world, is going to tell you to invest in a work like Common Ground? What financial planner is going to say, this is a wise decision. You should take a lot of money that's yours, and you should give it to this organization that's going to do work for God. Nobody's going to tell you that. They're going to, a good financial planner, according to the wisdom of the world, is going to tell you, buy stock. Buy stock for yourself so that you'll have more money at the end of your life, and so that you can take the next half of this last breath of a life that you have and hoard more resources for yourself. Do that instead of investing in eternal rewards, in an eternal return, right? That's the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. You know, Jesus teaches us to love our enemies. What does the wisdom of the world say? The wisdom of the age say, it says, kill your enemies, subdue your enemies. And that's why a nation wars against nation to take land for themselves. And then what happens? They die apart from God and become dirt and dust. They become part of the land. And then the next generation, a new possessor comes along and walks upon them. It's not their land anymore, right? Again and again, this is the wisdom of the age that is literally coming to nothing. The common way that thinks Jesus and the cross is stupid is actually the common intelligence and brilliance of us human beings that comes to no end. 
What we speak and understand as believers, like that which I contrasted with the wisdom of the world when I said, look, we're investing in heaven. Oh, the world says that's stupid. Oh, we're going to love our enemies. The world says that's stupid. It is a wisdom which Paul says in verse 7 was kept a mystery by God until this time that he revealed it through Jesus. It comes from above and it avails much instead of the wisdom of the world that avails nothing. But the real point in Paul saying all this is no human being came to it on their own. Nobody before Jesus said anything like Jesus. No human being could ever point out or reveal what God was planning to do through Jesus until Jesus did it. Now, all the evidence of what God was planning and what he would do through Jesus is right there in the Old Testament. Now we see it everywhere. You know, the, the hints of God's plan are there in the book of Genesis in the first couple chapters. I mean... The plan of God was hiding in plain sight, but the point is no one discovered it. No one had any idea what God was doing from the beginning of recorded history. God had to reveal it. The gospel is like this great riddle. You know, Paul inserts that quote in verse 9 from Isaiah 64, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no mind has conceived. Those are the things God has prepared for those who love him. Nobody could see it. Nobody could hear it. Nobody could understand it like a great riddle. Uh, let, me, let me share with you guys some riddles here. Maybe you can find the answer. What is always in front of you but can't be seen? The future. Marvel at me. Yes, wow, the wisdom. What is always in front of you but can't be seen? The future. What question can you never answer yes to? Are you asleep yet? Ah... Oh. You know, what is smart but makes you stupid? A smartphone. Oh, that last one's actually mine, so that is impressive, right? Like a riddle, the answer is like right there. Anytime you hear a riddle, anytime anyone asks you a riddle, you just like, I, I'm about to guess it. I'm about to guess it. Like, I know, just give me a little bit more time. Just give me a little bit more time. Just let me think about it. Like, the answer is right there all the time with a riddle. It's hiding in plain sight. But you always feel silly, right, when you hear the answer because it was there, but you never come to it. And, and you marvel at the one who gives you the answer because, wow, they reveal something that you couldn't see for yourself. The riddle of life of God's plan, it's been guessed at by generation after generation. Everyone trying to figure out what God has done, what's the meaning of all this. And the answers have been hiding in plain sight, but no one saw them. God had to reveal it, and it revealed not just his marvelous insight and his marvelous plan, but also human ignorance. The point again, God alone is the source of all true wisdom. It's never ever human beings who could guess the answers. So why do we give human beings so much credit? Why do we keep looking to them? Now starting in the second half of verse 10 all the way to verse 16, Paul begins to explain how simple people like you and I have received this wisdom of God that's distinguished from the wisdom of the age by talking about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And his overriding goal here in these next six verses is to further deepen our humility and extinguish any hint of human pride in talking about the things of God. But secondarily, he's also giving us great insight into how the Holy Spirit works in the lives of believers, which is very important because his work is often confused for us as followers of Jesus. So how does the Holy Spirit do his work to reveal God's wisdom from above to us. Verse 10 says, The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. Verse 11, For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So does this make sense to you? You and I uh, have, as far as we're concerned, this like invisible inner life that's real to us, but you know, unobtainable as far as access for anyone else. You know, we have this inner room you could imagine in our mind and heart where we're able to think things, we're able to talk to ourselves if we so choose, we're able to imagine, we're able to perceive in a room for which no one has the key. But if there was a way to let you in to that room of my mind and heart, if I could give you the key, then you could search out the deep things of Andrew. <gasps> You know, I don't want you to see that room. 
I don't want you to go there. But if I had access to that invisible space in all of your minds, and I could search out your deep thoughts, and in real time I could see what's going on in that inner room while I'm preaching this sermon, I might also be terrified as to what you're thinking. But just like that, Paul says, the Spirit of God has access to the mind of God and understands the deep things of God, the thoughts of God. And the miracle of the gospel is through faith in Jesus, we receive the Spirit of God to inhabit our own bodies. Verse 12, what we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. So what Paul is asserting here and reminding the believers of is nothing less than the everyday supernatural experience of Jesus' followers that is oft neglected. Get this, guys. Through faith... You and I have received the Spirit who has access to the deep things of God, the thoughts of God, and He's now freely sharing it with you and I, like entering into the room of our mind and heart and dialoguing with every single one of us so that we may understand God's thoughts, the Spirit openly speaking and freely sharing to our spirit. That is why Paul could say in verse 5 of chapter 1, we have been enriched with all knowledge and speech because this is what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. In verse 7 of chapter 1, the first week of the series, I was talking about how we've received every spiritual gift. We lack no spiritual gift. Why? Because of this reality that's being talked about in this chapter. God is not in the business of withholding anything from us. He's not a riddle maker with us. He's not a mystery maker with us. He's a riddle revealer. He's a mystery revealer, a riddle solver. He was given that we might understand what God has freely given to every single one of us, his wisdom. Now, how does this dialogue in our hearts and minds work with God? Well, verse 13, this is what we speak, Paul says, not in words taught us in human wisdom, so not the stuff you go learn at graduate school or you'd learn at any other institutions of the world, but in words taught by the Spirit, Explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. Now, that's a real mouthful right there. But what Paul's saying here in verse 13, he doesn't say, like, guys, now we literally have this other language other than English that only Christians speak in. Paul means the message of the cross, the message of Jesus, are the spirit-taught words, are the new realities, are the new concepts, and all that message is a dialect that we could not understand or perceive unless we were enabled to by the Spirit of God. Like, yesterday I sat down at the coffee shop next to a young man in this church community who works in data analytics for financial companies. Or at least, that's what I walked away thinking he does. Because I didn't fully understand what he does. When you start talking complicated language around financial instruments, you might as well be speaking in a different language to me, right? And it's not because he wasn't speaking English. He was speaking English, but the concepts were foreign to me. In the same way, when I talk about loving our enemies because Jesus loved us as sinners, the world hears it in English but doesn't understand it. And yet we do only because God has taught us to understand it by his Spirit in us. And in fact, every single time you and I think the thoughts of God, the thoughts that align with God, Anytime you or I value or care about the things that align with the values and the cares of God, it is a supernatural dialogue that's being revealed where the Spirit is sharing with us what He cares about, what He thinks about the things that we're thinking about. Everything that is of Christ and leads to Christ is a product of God at work in us. So when I share the truths of God, even right now, it is God that's enabling me to do so. And if you're perceiving anything that I'm saying that's true of the Scriptures, it is God that is enabling you right now to understand it by His Holy Spirit. So this is what drives me absolutely nutty, mad, insane about Christianity and Christian culture. Because there are certain parts of Christian culture where believers just sort of ignore and don't even talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. But when they're talking about the cross and when they're talking about Jesus and when they're saying everything that they say that accords with the Bible, it's all enabled by the Holy Spirit that they don't even talk about. You know, then there's another part of Christianity 
that really believes they're giving a lot of attention to the Holy Spirit, but they link the Spirit's work only with those things that we think are sensational, the signs, the things that are like over-the-top miraculous, at the expense of the majority of the work that the Spirit is doing in the everyday, in the mundane. He's doing exactly what Jesus told us he would be doing in John chapter 16, Verse 13, constantly guiding us into all truth by helping us recall what Jesus has revealed, comforting us by his spirit within our spirit. Friends, the spirit of God is ubiquitous in the Christian life. And that's a big word, but that just means he's everywhere. Like life-giving oxygen is ubiquitous. It's all around us, like gravity It's everywhere. It's a force that is pulling on every single one of us, even though we can't see it, like the wind, right? It's invisible to the human eye, but it moves the physical. So the Spirit of God is that oxygen, is the life in our Christianity, is the gravity that grounds us, is the wind of God that moves us in everything. And without that understanding of how common and available the Spirit is, Jesus followers think they have to try super hard and work in really detailed ways to sort of like work up prophecy, you know, and and to speak something that is of God, you know, and oh, let's try very hard to say something new and creative and now, oh, it's God speaking and they, they try too much. And then on the other side, if we don't realize how common and available the spirit is, A lot of times we'll work out of insecurity and anxiety. We'll go to share with somebody about Jesus or we'll go to encourage another believer, but we do so without authority. We do so with timidity because we think that what we're saying is coming from us and is hindered by our own weakness. Friends, when we speak the words of Christ, the truth of the Scriptures over each other, it isn't last night's leftovers re-warmed up, Okay? It is what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. When you speak to each other, speak as if you're speaking the very words of God. Because when we speak the words of God, this is alive. This is active by the Spirit of God. And when we speak them, we speak what is not of us. We speak the words of God to each other, through each other. So Paul wants the believers to know that what they've received is not from the power of men. It resides from the power of God so that they're empowered with the mind of Christ, not intimidated or desiring what may appear like wisdom in the world's eyes. Walking away from this, there's a couple things I want to leave us with. Number one, friends, the Spirit of God deserves a lot more credit in our Christianity. The Spirit of God deserves more credit in our Christianity. When we make our Christianity about people, we miss out on God. Paul's saying, look, if anyone that you've ever known in Christianity speaks with wisdom, none of it came from them. If anything that they said is true, if anything that they said is good, if anything that they said accords with Christ, they're just sharing with you something that they first had revealed to them by God. Why are you going around giving all these people so much credit for things they could have never dreamed up? They could have never seen and they could have never heard unless God revealed it to them. And and what makes them special? Because they've received the same Spirit of God that you have and everything that they know, God is freely extending to every single one of you as well. Nobody in Christ has something that you can't have. It's all God sharing everything he is with us. He's everywhere and in everything of Christ that is in all of you. And he deserves a lot more credit for everything that's going on. Number two, along with that, when we realize how active and how at work the Holy Spirit is, man, we can lean into this. we got to live empowered and speak empowered by the Spirit. You know, applying this doesn't mean that we're forcing a bunch of creative prophesying power. Guys, I want you to go away from here and speak in your spiritual voice more. You know, that's not what it means to live and speak empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I've been in so many different cultures of Christianity, and every single one of them has their way that they start to speak by the Holy Spirit. You know, and it's this sort of phrasing and this language and this incantation, you know, and, and now we're in the spiritual voice and we're, we're speaking empowered. Guys, 
Let's just take it down a notch. Let's realize that the Spirit enables everything that is of Christ in us all the time. It's, he's in us. He's, he's closer to us than our own nose. I mean, that, that's how real and ever-present and active God is in the lives of every single believer. So speak with authority what is true from the Scriptures and of Christ because it isn't you. Because it isn't you who says it. Share it with those who don't believe. Share it with those who do. And you are sharing the mind of Christ. In your weakness, you can't even hold that back. Live empowered, not intimidated. That's the message here. And number three, let's listen and learn the language of God. How do you learn a language? I learned French. In high school. What a waste. I mean, I'm sorry if you're French. There's just not a lot of you people here in America speaking French all the time. So what a waste. I learned French. I forgot French. Je m'appelle Andrew. That's all I've got. Uh, uh, je ne comprends. I don't understand. That's all I got. I said that one a lot, right? That's why I remember it. Guys, why did I forget my French? I forgot my French because I don't hear anyone speaking it any longer around me. We've got to listen to and learn the language of God by exposure to it, by being taught it, by sitting with the Scriptures so that we can know what the wisdom of God sounds like so that we can discern it, so that when we're thinking when we're feeling, when we're perceiving in the room, the inner room of our mind and heart, we can tell the difference between our voice and God's voice. Do you know how you tell the difference? Everything that accords with the truth of the Scriptures, with the truth of Jesus, is God's voice. It's not your thoughts. It's a dialogue that God is having with you in the most intimate place in your soul, in your own spirit. But if I don't listen to and if I don't learn this wisdom and truth and this language, these concepts, and I pattern myself after the wisdom of the world, well, that's going to make me forget and not live according to the wisdom of God. Right? I can't listen to two voices at once. My kids try. Let's both speak at the same time. He's going to understand both of us. I can't listen to two at the same time, much less five, and we can't do the same in our own soul and spirit. The wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. We've got to silence ourselves. We've got to quiet ourselves before God's word and hear his words and learn and understand and discern the mind of Christ. He's working so that we might freely grasp it. Well, let's pray together. Let's ask for the Lord to deepen these things in our life and let's give him some more credit this morning. Would you pray with me as we move into a time of worship and response out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2? And Heavenly Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, we want to give you more credit for all that happens around us, God. For all that happens in us. For all that's happened through Christian history. Why do we keep searching for people to prop up and people to make heroes out of and idols out of? God, we have you. And Jesus, you're the perfect one. Lord, we want to give you the credit. Everything that's in us that is of you is from you, has its source in you, is enabled by you. You're at work in everyone and in everything that's a part of your kingdom. You deserve the credit. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. There isn't a single pastor of renown. There isn't a single spiritual leader of renown that isn't just sharing something that you've first given them as a gift, as grace that they could have never come to on their own. And that's true of us too, God. So, Lord, we just give you more credit for what you're doing in our life. Would we stop taking credit in our soul and spirit for the things that are you speaking? If it's of you, it's from you. If we understand your word, it's because your spirit is helping us understand your word. Would we see you everywhere and in everything that is this Christian life that we're living? That's going to make us empowered, God so that we're not timid, so that we're not shy about what's your truth. It's your truth. You're the one speaking it. And if it affects something in someone else, it wasn't us, it was you. God, some of us have insecurities. We think, how can, how can I be used to share the gospel with my neighbors? How can I be used to share it with my own kids? And we think our weaknesses hold us back. God, sometimes it's our strengths that hold us back because that 
clouds what you're really doing. Lord, you can use our weaknesses. You use Paul's. So Lord, will we live empowered by your Holy Spirit? Would we speak the words of your truth as if we're speaking your very words because they are your words through us. And help us to be a culture that's learning and listening to your language. We want all of our speech. We want everything we say. We want the way that we relate in our marriages and our friendships to just all be the language of the gospel. Yeah, we're speaking English, but this community would just be speaking a different language than the rest of this world and the wisdom of this world, but the wisdom that comes from above that's going to yield much in our lives and in the lives of others. Fill us with that wisdom, God. Fill this community with that speech, your speech, God, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me as we move into a time of response and we just spend some time literally giving God the credit. The ministry team is gonna be at the four corners of the room. If you need prayer for any reason at all, would you come forward and would you receive that prayer as we lift up praise to God together?